There were many problems with the film. And the thing that people don't realize, I, I really don't think many people realize, is that it was the talented people that Bob had around him that made that even possible to get something to release. What had happened was the studio had promised theaters that the film would come in and not only come in on time, but come in at uh, 131 minutes or 130 minutes with credits because they needed to fit it into their time slots for having number of shows per day. Mm -hmm. And the studio had pre-sold it. So they had contracts with theaters all over the world that they're going to have this big event on this day. And while there were some issues with shooting it, but everything was completed on schedule for shooting, uh, 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 the original intentional photography, um, they went to the visual effects company that was hired called Robert Abel and Associates. And they had brilliant ideas on how to do something that looked like things that nobody had ever seen before. And Abel was doing a lot of 70s, you know, chrome commercials and such. There was beautiful work. But when they went and looked at their work about a year after and a few million dollars after, the, they didn't have any finished shots at all. What they, the tests that they showed weren't usable. And they had to bring in Richard Urasich, who came to came from Doug Trumbull's team to go and analyze this. And Doug came in and they finally realized that while Robert Abel's ideas were solid and would be beautiful, there was no way they were going to complete them on time. So there we are with a film that had been roughly assembled with effect sequences that were not going to be ready. So I think it was um, around this time that, that, that uh, Bob and Gene Roddenberry went to Michael Eisner, who was running the studio at the time, and said, listen, this is an emergency. We, don't, we won't have the effects done in time. We can't get the film finished in time. And Michael Eisner said, knowing that with those contracts in place, there was a lot on the line. The entire studio could be sued out of existence. Who knows what the politics were? That might have been because of the powerful deals. I mean, Star Wars had made so much money that that everybody was relying on this studio. The, the theaters cleared their schedule. You know, they knew what they were doing, but they were contracts that said this will be happening. That Michael said, um, this is something we, we were told, uh, I don't care if the film has Black Leader in it, it has to go out. And black leader is usually what you have for shot missing. I don't care if it's in, if it says shot missing, and not that says it, but I mean, if this black leader is spelling it, it must go out. So, you know, imagine being this legendary filmmaker, Robert Wise, who's never had a film go out of control, looking at, I have to do this. And Doug Trumbull was, was brought on, uh, and he said, it's too much work for me. And they brought on uh, uh, John Dykstra, you know, amateurs in the industry. John, you know, John, Doug with his 2001 and Close Encounters and Silent Running History and, and John just came off that little film, Star Wars. At least these were the best people in the world to work on the film. And they started uh, at that point a very intensive three eight hour shift days. They never stopped working to do uh, all of the effects in time. And there were errors, there were incomplete shots there were effects elements that never made it into the picture there were effects shots that were delivered although we never well there were effects shots that were delivered after they finished the cut of the film and before releasing it they the, the editor and bob sat down and they knew that they had the 130 minute shot a uh, running time that they had to deliver it so they trimmed everything that they could in scenes out of it to just get the most basic story, understanding that when the effects came in, they then put these things back in and get the film's flow together to make it work. And the problem is the effects were coming in down to the absolute last moment. So some of that footage that Bob had planned to put back in never made it back into the picture, including the point of the picture, the Spock crying scene didn't make it back into the picture, but it was intended to go back into the picture. So what happened was down to that wire, reel by reel, they were finishing it and sending it off to MGM because they had no choice. MGM was making the prints, had no choice but to cut an egg and put the thing together and make the reels. And literally 
wet, dripping with chemical wet. The last reel was put into a can, which Bob picked up met himself and took to the airport and flew to, to Washington, D.C. and slept with the movie under his bed um, before the premiere the next day. And everybody flew out there to watch it. These people are exhausted. And they flew out to watch it. And you sat there and you watched the first screening of Star Trek, the motion picture. And there are places where, since the effects came in, again, intended to be tightened, like anything you do, your first thing is you assemble it. They went from first frame to last frame of the effects to just put it in. And there are places where ships weren't moving yet. So you'd have one shot of like the Enterprise and, and a few frames in, one of the ships starts moving. So it's still in it. And that's jarring. And it's disturbing. And it causes, you know, additional problems in a film where it's the, 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 it's not smooth anymore. It has problems. So they watch this and the editor had said to us that as he's watching the film, he's shrinking lower and lower in his seat because there's things that just were driving him crazy that he knew he needed to fix. So they screened it. And afterwards, Bob and Gene went back to Bob Michael Eisner and said, listen, you know, we still have a little bit of time before the theatrical release. Let me get in and do some tweaking. Let's fix that up a little. Let's get it at least smoother. And the answer was no. It, we're too, it's too much of a concern that if we do, then um, people may get the idea that the studio doesn't have faith in the picture if you had to go back and make changes if the word got out. So we have to go with it. So imagine a mad rush of scrambled mess put into theaters. And I believe it or not, it was one of the more, it was very successful. Uh, one of the reasons, one of the ways that I was presenting this uh, and people forget about this is that, you know, people say, look at the box office, you know, the others made more money. Well, one of the first things that I did when I'm trying to convince people at the studio and otherwise about how the importance of the picture is I worked on it for adjusted dollars to today. And the only film that made more money than it was uh, JJ's 2019, uh, 2009, that one, because it had the same benefit that motion picture had. And that's that motion picture at that point, if you've ever watched the first assembly of a picture, it doesn't have the flow. It's just, here's the stuff presented to you to look at. You work out the flow later, that when you fine tune things, this was an assembly. And I remember he even went to Jerry Goldsmith and said, Jerry, I don't know what we're gonna be looking at. I need you to write me a symphony. And he did. And that's the whole going through the cloud was written without any understanding about what would be there. Jerry knew he was carrying the film and Bob had that. And even that became too long. So even that had to be tightened in, 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 in uh, a little, but you don't want to lose the beautiful imagery that we're seeing at the same time. But all those jarring moments throughout the film distracted and, um, Jumping ahead a little, that was one of my specific focuses this time, more than ever before, was that even when we did it back for the DVD, there were places throughout the film where something is jarring, where we couldn't fix it as well as we could now, but we did now. For example, the beautiful zoom in shot of Kirk before it cuts to the Enterprise, there's this, there's this view, zoom in shot on him. And as it's zooming in, when you get close to him, the camera goes and then gets closer. And that thing just suddenly goes, whoa, you're watching this, you're, you're like you're focused on his eyes, but then the shake takes you out of the movie. And this time around, one of my primary focuses were to was to make sure that all of those disturbing little moments that take you out, jar you, that shake you, that have you look at those instead of being in the movie as an audience member, just enjoying what you're seeing had to be smoothed out. And other examples are the, the, the effects were so rushed that in the composites, there was some massive grain because they used high speed film for some of that work that the grain became so big that all you could see was this beautiful image with grain everywhere. And the point was to go and carefully shot by shot, removing that grain, but making sure none of the detail was lost. 
it was not anything automatic. It was a manual process of cleaning that so that it could be smooth and then put in a consistent grain. So you don't have that jarring removal of your experience uh, taking you out of it. It's the same thing when they're talking about transmitting the signal to, to V'ger, you know, Spock transmit now, he hits his hand, his hand shakes, and then you have uh, a Decker go, transmitting, and it's another, sh that, no, that's another thing that takes you out of the moment because you're jarred by it. So now that's smoothed out. And because we were working from the camera negative of the film throughout the whole thing, it was all from the camera negative, there's more room around the frame of what you're seeing so that it didn't have to be one of those classic, well, if you're gonna freeze, stabilize it, you need to freeze it there and then zoom in to get your, no, there's actually room so that we are able to stabilize it and then have the real frame without losing any picture quality. And it's also wonderful now that, but one of the things that Bob hated was the, uh, the terrible flicker of the monitors all over the bridge. They flickered a lot, even to the point where he started, uh, since it was, he started filming, uh, staging people that you'll notice later in the film as it goes along, actors are standing in front of the monitors that flicker the most. They staged them so that he, they would be blocking the monitors. Thanks to technology today, we're able to go in and get them all stable so that they don't flicker because it's another thing that you're watching. And I mean, look at my face right now. Can you pay attention to my face while I'm making, you know, you have to be alert to the other movement that's going on when you should be looking at me. Yeah. And it was all about now, how can we take out everything that was distracting in the picture and make it work so that it's all about your experience, that you get to enjoy seeing the film. And it's about how you feel to what you're watching, not the distractions. You know, one of the other things was that the travel pod with, with Kirk and Scotty, that uh, the effects at the time, the way they did it was that they projected them onto the glass front and because of it they kind of looked bulbous there they didn't look real and this time we actually took them and moved them back a little so that they now look natural and the thing is i hope you didn't notice it because yeah. no one should notice these things they should just now look right as opposed to that little bit that's that that, that takes away your belief of what's going on. And that was my whole goal this time was to get a smoother picture. But with what they had, you know, when we do, when you do, and the reason it didn't happen last time was that when you do standard def transfers, you do all the color, color correction before you do the finished film, before, before we would do our recut. So we had our masters and we did that. There was no reason, no way to go back and have all that latitude of, of adjustment uh, that you could do after we did our edit. So with standard definition, it didn't give us the color grade abilities that we have with the negative. Plus, when I came back this time, I told them that the, the goal here, the 100% goal, was not a video, not a Blu-ray, not a 4K disc, not a streaming version. It was a new film negative. You know, we had always intended that when we presented the standard definition version to the studio, okay, here you go. Now let's go finish it on film. And there really were no revivals at the time. There was no reason for them to do it. So I, we, we just, you know, thought that they would because they'd see how wonderful it was and let us go further. But instead we had, hey, DVD was where the studio made its money. So they did. And all these years later, we're finally able to get back. But, um, you know, it was sad because the director's edition was the closest thing to the finished film of a completed version of the film. And on iTunes, it was go buy the theatrical version. Oh, by the way, we'll throw in the director's edition. That's a freebie. That's a bit, you know, out of order. And I can't tell you how absolutely thrilled I am that number one, I didn't have to push for it. It just happened. The studio has embraced the director's edition as the movie now. And that's wonderful. And now you go to iTunes and buy it. You get the director's edition and you'll get the unfinished 1979 work print that was in theaters uh, as the bonus, the way it should be. But they were